All right, so let's get started with chapter three. We're going to be discussing digestion, absorption, and transportation. All right, so digestion pretty much is the breaking down of foods into nutrients for our bodies to absorb and then subsequently use. Task of the, of the mouth. Digestion begins in the mouth. You both have chemical digestion and mechanical. The mechanical digestion is mastication or chewing, and then the chemical is you actually start breaking down starches with your saliva. Then you have the muscles of the diaphragm. They partially control the lower esophageal sphincter, which you'll see a picture of later. And it's the one that closes the space between your esophagus and your stomach or opens it. Okay? You always want a nice, steady, continuous movement of uh, digestive food through your GI tract. Uh, another important part is lubrication of food. It starts again in the mouth. Saliva it doesn't only just digest, it also lubricates the food. Um, think about when you swallow a pill without any water or with no saliva and it, you feel it scratching all the way down. So you do need the lubrication of food and it continues through the, uh, through the system. Uh, then you have digestive enzyme function. The enzymes are the ones that facilitate the breaking down of these macronutrients or the energy nutrients. Okay, We'll talk about those in more detail in the later chapters. And then obviously you want good excretion of waste in form of feces or urine, which we'll talk about later. All right, so when I say GI tract, I mean gastrointestinal tract. It is flexible and it is muscular. It's actually a smooth muscle, meaning that you can mentally control it in the sense that you can't think right now, hmm, I'm going to make my small intestine contract. You just can't do that like if you would a biceps. So the path of food or the path of nutrients through your GI tract is it starts in the mouth, it, got, it goes down to the esophagus, then the stomach, then the small intestine, then the large intestine, then the rectum, and the anus. I actually want to go a little bit more in depth with the path. And yes, you have to know the details. So yes, it starts in the mouth, then it goes to the esophagus, then the stomach. But then the small intestine is actually divided into three sections. You have the duanum, the jejunum, and the ileum. An easy way of memorizing this is DJ ileum. And that's the order that you need to know. The large intestine, or the colon, also is divided into three segments or three sections, and you do need to know their order. The order is ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon. Then you have um, the rectum and then the anus, or out the anus, okay? Your GI tract is a continuous inner space. You know, you could open it from the mouth to the anus. It's just one continuous inner space, and this is called a lumen. All right, so here's your GI tract, and it shows you what happens with the digestion through each segment, okay? So this is a good review for the entire chapter if you guys want to read it after to make sure that you understand everything that is going on. All right, the anatomy of the digestive tract. Like I said, it starts at the mouth. So the process of digestion begins in the mouth. You have mastication, okay, or chewing. Also, in your mouth, you have your tongue, and you have four basic taste sensations. Sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. Some people say we may have a fifth one, such as savory. Okay. Another thing is, whatever your mouth feels or tastes also is going to um, influence your choice of food. So this is the aroma. Think of when you're sick and you can't smell because your nose is stuffy. You can't taste things. So there is a connection between, between your sense of smell and sense of taste. Also, the texture of the food, it happens all the time. People say, oh, I don't like the certain texture of a food. I like the taste, but not the texture. An example would be onions. And then the temperature of the food. Some people, for example, won't drink cold coffee because they just don't think or don't like coffee being cold. Then you have your pharynx. Your pharynx is both digestive and respiratory. Okay. Um, when you, after you chew this food and it mixes with your saliva and you swallow it, the technical term for it is bolus. All right, so once you swallow, it goes down into your esophagus, and the esophagus has two sphincters. What are sphincters? They're muscles. They're smooth muscles, and they're openings. They're the openings that pretty much dictate um, the time or how, how frequently food passes through your system. So they, con they control the flow. So the one here that you have to focus on is the lower esophageal sphincter. There's a sphincter in between the esophagus and the stomach. So this sphincter is always closed unless there is food that comes down the esophagus and stimulates it to open to go into the stomach. Now, this is the, the sphincter that's responsible for acid reflux or GERD, meaning that it doesn't stay closed when there's no food. So then 
you get a backflow of digestive juices or acid up your esophagus and that's why you feel the burn. Moving on to the next one is your stomach. Your stomach actually churns bolus. It starts to move it, okay? Um, the connection between the sm stomach and the small intestine, you have your pyloric sphincter. Once it mixes and it becomes this acidic mush, uh, the technical term is chyme, and this chyme moves on to the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. All right, once it hits the small intestine, then um, you it's very acidic, okay? Your stomach acid is at a pH of 2. So how do you neutralize that? Well, this is where the common bile duct comes into play. The pancreas and the gallbladder both need to excrete these um, juices, digestive juices, into the small intestine, and they come together through the common bile duct. Now, the pancreas, like we'll see later on, actually has bicarbonate in it, helping to neutralize the acidic chyme. And remember that your small intestine is divided into three segments. You have the duodenum, the, the, the jejunum, and the ileum. Then after that comes the large intestine, and the connection between the small intestine and the large intestine, you have your ileocecal valve, which is another sphincter. So this sphincter is one that controls the movement of the digestive food from the small intestine into the colon or large intestine. The purpose of the large intestine is to withdraw water and also some of the minerals. And then the, the digestive food moves on to the rectum, waiting to be expelled through the anus as feces. And then you also have your anal sphincter that's always closed until you have to pass feces. So this is what the colon looks like. Okay, give me one second to bring this up real quick. All right, so here is the end of the small intestine, right? Right here, the purple. So this little guy right here, this is your ileocecal valve. And then this is the movement of food. So you have your um, ascending colon right here. So it goes up, then you have... Your transverse colon right here, which is the second one. Sorry for that. It's the computer. And then when food moves down this way, obviously it's going to be your descending colon right here. You do not have to worry about the sigmoid colon at all for this. Okay? Then it's held in the rectum, and then it goes out the anus. All right, so let's skip these. This is just what we covered right now. Sorry, I should have deleted these sooner. I don't know why it's repeated. Come on. All right, so the muscular action of digestion is called peristal uh, peristalsis. Sorry, peristalsis. So you have cir circular and longitudinal muscles working together, okay, to have a nice movement of food throughout your GI tract. The rate and the intensity of the contractions do vary, so think of when you just eat food and it doesn't and it sits well and you don't even notice it. Your body is moving in nice and it's smooth contractions, as opposed to when you get food poisoning and you have to rush to the bathroom and you get these very sharp cramps and sharp contractions because they need to expel whatever is making you sick. There are some factors that may interfere with peristalsis, such as medication. Sometimes the side effect of medication is constipation. You just don't move. Um, moving on to stomach action. Stomach has three types of muscle. It has cir circular, longitudinal, and diagonal. Okay, The release of chyme is timed, and the pyloric sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine releases chyme about three times a minute into the small intestine. So this is a picture of the uh, stomach muscles. The deep one is the diagonal, then comes the circular, and the uh, superficial one is the longitudinal. So yes, your stomach is pretty much a muscle. All right, moving on about moving on to muscular actions of digestion. So segmentation, food starts to get segmented, starts to break down into smaller pieces as it passes through our digestive tract. So this is due to the contraction of circular muscles in the small intestine. And at the same time, this contraction actually helps mix the chyme a little bit more and it promotes the contact with the absorption cells. And you want this because most of the absorption of your nutrients happens in the small intestine. So this contraction actually promotes the contact of the chyme to the absorption cells. All right, moving on to sphincter contractions. The sphincters, like I said before, they periodically open and close, and they are the ones that control the pace of the GI tract contents. If they are not working properly, you're going to have reflux. In other words, things are going to move the opposite way, and you do not want that. 
All right, so um, an example of a, of a sphincter muscle. So let me get my little pen right here. Okay, so this right here is your esophagus, which is the purple, and then this is the beginning of the stomach down here, which is kind of like a beige color. Right here are your smooth muscles, okay, of the sphincter, of the lower esophageal sphincter. And then this one on the side here are your diaphragm muscles. So when there is food in this area here, it stimulates the muscles to go ahead and relax, opening the passageway, allowing food to go into the stomach. Okay, when there is no food, all these muscles contract, closing the opening, including the diaphragm. So here you see that the diaphragm is part of it. Okay, so when these muscles contract, it squeezes and it closes the opening. Now, when you have acid reflux disease or GERD, these guys here are not working that much, so they stay a little bit open. And if they're open, it allows the stomach acid to go up this way. Okay, and that's the burning sensation that you feel. All right, so secretions of digestion. You have five organs that secrete digestive juices. Your salivary glands, your stomach, your pancreas, your liver, and your small intestine. Um, these secretions are, are mostly water, and they contain enzymes. Enzymes are actually proteins, and these proteins facilitate chemical reactions. They facilitate the breaking down of macronutrients into smaller units. Now, this is where um, terminology is going to help you out. Let me get my little pen again. Okay, so right here, anything that ends in ASC is an enzyme. So, for example, the enzyme that breaks down lipids or fats is called a lipase. An enzyme that breaks down protein is a protease. Okay, so this is really easy. Now comes another terminology, hydrolysis. Hydro means water and lysis means to break apart. So enzymes, what they do is that they use water to break apart units, okay, into smaller units. And you'll see later on how this happens. All right, so your saliva, it moistens food for easy passage. It's, um, it plays also a protective role. It also has antibiotic um, properties, so it helps control the bacteria in your mouth. And it starts carbohydrate digestion, specifically starches. Then in the stomach, you have your gastric juice that's made out of water, enzymes, and acid. So the protein digestion starts with hydrochloric acid in the stomach. In your stomach, you also have mucus. You have... Mucus being produced to coat the lining of the stomach to protect it from the hydrochloric acid. Because you, your, your gastric juice, the pH is a 2. It's very acidic, so you need to protect it. When for some reason the mucus is not um, thick enough or it starts to waste away, this is when you start developing an ulcer. All right, this is the location of your salivary glands right in front of your ears and underneath your tongue. All right, so this is the pH scale that we were talking about, okay? So, all right, so here in the middle is neutral, and for example, your saliva is a bit neutral, same as water. Now down here is your gastric juice. It's as acidic as lemon juice, all right? So think about when you eat ceviche, that you cook the fish with the lemon juice. That's because of the acidity of it. Now, when you go a little bit more basic, that's where you're going to find your pancreatic juice and bile. Why your pancreatic juice? Well, remember the pancreas also produces bicarbonate and it helps neutralize the acidity of the chyme when it's released out of the stomach into the small intestine. All right, so talking about the pancreatic juice and intestinal enzymes, they are released via ducts into the duodenum. Remember, the duodenum is the first segment of your small intestine. The enzymes act on all three energy nutrients, so your, it, it acts on your fats, on your carbs, and on your proteins. And through the pancreatic juice, you also get sodium bicarbonate, like I was saying before, in order to neutralize or make the chyme slightly um, alkaline. Now, the bile that is released into your small intestine is not an enzyme, but an emulsifier. What an emulsifier does is that it helps mix water with oil. For example, if you are at home right now and you get a little bit of water and put a little bit of oil in it and shake it, it really isn't going to mix. It's going to separate almost immediately. But do, try to do the same with a salad dressing that is separated 
between the liquid and the oil. You shake it and it stays mixed for a long time. This is because they add an emulsifier to it, okay? Now, bile is produced in the liver and then is sent to the gallbladder, which concentrates it, stores it, and then excretes it through the common bile duct into our small intestine. All right, so summary of digestive secretions and their major actions. This is just a general um, summary. You do not need to know this in detail, but it's a good, um, good thing to, to just take a look at to see what are the secretions and what are their major actions. All right, the final stage on digestive residues such as fiber. You don't digest fiber, okay? Now, fiber is good for you. Why? Because it exercises your intestinal muscles. And yes, believe it or not, your intestinal muscles do need to be exercised. I'll show you later on what happens when you don't. Um, at the same time, it helps, it helps with the retention of water, and then it affects your, your stool consistency. So this is why I love fiber. You can never go wrong with fiber. If you're constipated, have some fiber. If you have diarrhea or loose stool, go ahead and have some fiber because it helps with the stool consistency. Now talking a little bit about the colon or the large intestine, you have intestinal bacteria in there. These are your good guys, your good bacteria, okay? And they ferment some of the fiber, so there may be a little bit of digestion because of your bacteria. Um, and then you have recyclable materials are retrieved in the colon or the large intestine, such as water and dis dissolved salts, as in minerals. All right, so this picture here is going to be very, very useful for you because it breaks down where the digestion happens for each of the macronutrients and fiber. So let's start with carbs. Where is my little pen? All right, so let's start with carbs right here. So like I said, because of your saliva, you do get some digestion of carbs in the mouth. Once it hits the stomach, there is no more digestion, okay? Until it hits the small intestine again, and then it's completely absorbed into the system. Now let's skip fiber for a minute and go into protein. There is no digestion of protein whatsoever in the mouth but then you start getting protein digestion in the stomach and it continues all the way down to the small intestine. Moving on to fat, there is a little bit of digestion of fat in the mouth, but not too much. It's very, 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 very minuscule, okay? There is no digestion at all in the stomach of fat, and then it starts digesting the fat in the small intestine until it's completely absorbed. Going to fiber, remember I said fiber is not digestible, so it's not going to be digested whatsoever. It's going to not digested by the stomach or the small intestine. So once it hits the large intestine, it may have a little bit of um, di uh, digestion. Why? Because of your bacteria ferment some of the fiber, okay? All right, absorption. So the majority of your absorption is going to happen in your small intestine. Your small intestine is about 10 feet long. With some people, it could go up to 14. The surface area is equivalent to a tennis court, okay? So if I get your small intestine and stretch it completely out, it's going to be the size of a tennis court. So how do we get this size, this large, such a large um, uh, amount of small intestine into our small abdomen? This is a technique called uh, folding. So take a sheet of paper and fold it in half and then fold it again and fold it again. So it's still the same surface area when you open it, but seeing that you folded it, it becomes smaller. Okay, so this is, I'll show you a picture later on so you can see this. Now your small intestine absorbs these nutrients three ways. So you have three absorption techniques. You have simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. So let's go through each one. All right, so up here you have the outside of your cell. This is the cell membrane right here, the middle, which is a, a phospholipid bilayer. We'll talk about it later. And then this is the inside of the cell, okay? So let's start with simple diffusion first. Simple diffusion is just that. You have these nutrients right in here that just simply diffuse through. These are the small nutrients, okay, such as water and small lipids, 
just cross the cell membrane freely. They could come and go as they please because they are small enough. Okay. The next one requ requires a carrier. This is your facilitated diffusion. So the carrier loads the nutrient um, on, outs on outside of the cell and then releases it inside the cell. Okay, so think of this kind of like a door with a lock. Okay, you need the key to be able to get in because you're too big to sneak right underneath the door. All right, only ants are able to sneak underneath the door. Okay, so some nutrients such as water soluble vitamins do require facilitated diffusion, they require somebody to get them through or something. Okay, then the other one is similar to facilitated diffusion but it requires energy because it requires more effort, okay? And this, an example of this would be your glucose and amino acids. The reason this happens is because the nutrients need to move against the concentration gradient, and this requires energy. So to break it down, really easy. So let's say there's a room that only 10 people fit in it, and then there is a door, okay? Now, underneath the door, there's a space that only an ant could go in through. Okay, so that is an example where your simple diffusion is small enough to go in, in and out at the bottom of the door, but a human cannot possibly go through there. Facilitated diffusion is that door. It allows the human in. Okay, now active transport is, let's say the inside of the room is packed with 10 people. The absolute, like it's saturated. Okay, but you want to stick one more person in there. So you have to actively open the door, grab the person and shove them in. Because you're shoving them in, it requires energy, okay? All right, the anatomy of the absorption system. So you have your villi. Villi select and regulate your nutrients absorbed. These are in your small intestine, and I'll show you a picture of this in the next slide. Then you have your microvilli, which are on your individual cells, and they contain enzymes and pumps. Then you have your crypts, which secrete intestinal juices, and you have your goblet cells, which secrete mucus. Remember, mucus is important for a nice movement of digested food. All right, so here is the picture that is very, very important. Let me get my little pen again. Okay, so here up here is your small intestine. And first, let's, let's take a look at these folds right in here. Okay, so that's one way to increase surface area. But the small intestine takes it to the next extreme. So each individual fold, which is right here, has villi on it. All right, villi are those finger like projections that you see there, each individual one. Those are villi, and they're always moving. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these villi right in here, in the next one. Okay. So this is your individual villi right here in the center, okay? And then you have another one here, another one here. So let's ignore the center one right now and take a look at the one to the left. So each little square that you see here is an individual cell, and here is a close-up of that cell. So this is the individual cell right in here, and as you can see, it has its own finger light projections, and these are your microvilli. So this is how the small intestine has such a large surface area, okay? Now, going back to this guy over here, let me change the color of the pen so you can see it a little bit better. All right. Okay, so what I need you to focus on, oh, and I'm sorry, going back to the villi right here, here you have your goblet cells, and in between the villi, you have your crypts, which are these little spaces right here, okay? Now, going back to the individual villi, this is where you get your circulatory system um, involved. The red is your artery, the blue, sorry, red is your artery, the blue is your vein, and then the yellow is your lymphatic vessel or your lymph system or lacteal, uh, lacteal duct, okay? So red, you follow it all through here, and then it's an artery, and it goes up here. And then this space right here, where the artery and the vein meet, this, uh, this is your capillaries, okay? Your capillaries is where the exchange happens of nutrients, of oxygen, of everything. Then it becomes a vein, and it goes out this way, okay? 
Now, this structure in the middle, the yellow, is your lymphatic vessel, okay, from your lymph system. And right now we're going to discuss what happens and why you have these two types of circulatory system in your digestive system. All right, so a closer, closer look at your intestinal cells. We already talked about the villi. They regulate nutrient absorption based on needs. Your microvilli have enzymes and pumps. And you do have specialized cells absorbing different nutrients. So they are specialized, okay? So there's this myth going around about food separating, that you, you should eat food separately. That is complete, um, completely false. All right, you could combine food. There is absolutely no problem with it. Your body is meant to eat food combined. And actually, it helps enhance the absorption. For example, when you eat iron, like um, um, iron-rich foods with vitamin C-rich food, the vitamin C actually enhances the absorption of iron. All right, so here's where it's going to get a little tricky, okay? So pay close attention to this, and you do have to know the difference. So your digestive system has two transport pathways. It has the bloodstream and it has the lymphatic system, okay? The bloodstream is where water-soluble nutrients and smaller products of fat digestion go. And these guys go directly to the liver, okay? Your lymphatic system, which is the little yellow one in between that we talked about, this is where your larger fats and your fat-soluble vitamins go. And your larger fats do need uh, transport proteins to help them out. And this is where your chylomicrons come into play, which we'll talk about in chapter 5. Okay, But the, one of the differences here is that your lymphatic system bypasses the liver at first. Okay, So this is what you need to know. Your bloodstream is where your water-soluble and your smaller nutrients go into, and they go directly to the liver. And your lymphatic system is where your larger fats and your fat-soluble vitamins go, and they actually bypass the liver at first. And later on, you'll see why. All right, let's talk about now the vascular system, all right? Your circulatory system, in other words. It's a closed system of vessels, and then your heart is the pump to get the blood flowing. So what does the blood do? It delivers oxygen and nutrients and removes carbon dioxide and waste. Um, carbon dioxide is exchanged for oxygen in the lungs, so that's where you excrete carbon dioxide. The kidneys also filter the waste from the blood, not the carbon dioxide, but everything else, and is excreted through the urine, or excreted in the urine, which we'll talk about in chapter <clears throat> 6. Alright, so here's where it's going to get a little bit tricky, and you guys really need to start, need to start paying attention, okay? So, let me get my pen again. Okay, so right up in here, this is your regular circulatory, and the rule of thumb is, is anything that goes out of the heart is an artery, then it goes into the capillaries with the exchange of nutrients, and then it goes into the veins, and then back into the heart. So in other words, anything that goes out of the heart is an artery, anything that goes back to the heart is a vein, and then the capillaries is where they both meet to exchange nutrients, okay? Now, these steps are actually a little bit different when it comes to the digestive system, all right? And yes, you have to know the order of this. So try to, um, let's try to keep track here. So first, it goes from the heart to the arteries, to the capillaries inside the intestines, then to the hepatic portal vein. But this vein doesn't empty into the heart. This vein actually empties into the liver. So it goes into the capillaries of the liver, and then it goes to the hepatic vein, which empties into the heart, okay? So here's where you see why the bloodstream goes to the liver first, not why those nutrients go to the liver first, because they're absorbed in the capillaries of the intestines, and they're taken by the hepatic portal vein into the liver first. Then they go through the hepatic vein into the heart. So a question in the exam could be, which of the following empties into the liver, the hepatic portal vein or the hepatic vein? And the answer would be the hepatic portal vein. Okay, so you do have to know the order of this. Another note is you're going to notice that your liver is the most metabolically active organ in your body. 
And once we start talking about a little more in depth about digestion, you're going to see why. All right, so this is the vascular system, all right? So try to keep track with me um, momentarily here so I can show you the difference. Come on, color. Okay, here, great. All right, first let's talk about regular uh, digestion, okay? I mean, sorry, regular circul circulation. All right, so you're going to start here. So this is the heart right here in the center, okay? And like I said, anything that goes out is an artery. So we're going to focus on the entire body first. So anything out, anything that is this reddish, pinkish color is an artery. Then you get the capillaries, which are purple. And then the blue is the vein, which goes back to the heart. Okay, now, like I said, this switches a bit when it comes to the digestive system. Okay, so let's talk about that one right now. All right, so again, same thing. Anything that goes out is an artery, but remember it goes to the capillaries inside your intestines, and then it goes to the hepatic portal vein. This vein connects these capillaries between your liver and your digestive tract. So this is your hepatic portal vein. It's not that big. It go and then it delivers it to the capillaries of the liver. And then it goes to the hepatic vein, which then takes it to the heart. Okay. All right, this is just uh, for you guys to see um, what the liver looks like. This whole thing right here is your liver. Okay. This is your hepatic portal vein right in here that spreads there. And then this is your hepatic vein that goes to the heart, which is right up in here. This little green guy right here, this is your gallbladder, okay? All right, let's talk about the lymphatic system. It's a one-way route. There is no pump, unlike your bloodstream that has your heart that is a pump. So, and, and your lymphatics actually circulate between your cells. So how do you move this system? Through muscle contraction. So it's very healthy to move around, okay? Um, at the end, it's collected at the thoracic duct, which is right behind your heart. How does it enter your bloodstream? Well, your thoracic duct opens into the subclavian vein, which then goes into the heart. Nutrients in the lymphatic vessels always bypass the liver at first, okay? All right, let's talk about your gut bacteria, your GI bacteria or, flor or flora. You have over 10 trillion of these guys in you, okay? Um, examples would be your lactobacillus and your bifidobacterium, and there's a bunch of other ones, okay? Most are not harmful, but they're actually very beneficial for you. Interestingly enough, we have more non-human cells in our bodies than human cells because bacteria are actually very small. So we have a lot more of these microorganisms than we do human cells. Now, factors that influence bacteria presence, diet, all right, such as probiotics. So an example of probiotic would be fermented food such as yogurt or if you just take probiotics. Prebiotics are kind of like our, our food for these guys, so it helps them um, survive, okay? Other factors that, that influence bacteria negatively would actually be your antibiotics. So you're given antibiotics because you have a bacterial infection, but antibiotics aren't too specific, so they may kill off some of your beneficial bacteria in your gut. So I do recommend having a probiotic when you're on antibiotics. Also, digestion of fibers and complex proteins are helped out by um, your GI bacteria and they also produce some of your vitamins, okay? So these guys are very, very important. All right, gastrointestinal hormones and nerve pathways. So you always have this, this homeostatic regulation. So your body always wants to be in homeostasis. What is homeostasis? Balance. It always wants to be balanced, okay? So how do you regulate this? Through your endocrine system, through your nervous system, through feedback mechanisms, which I'm gonna give you an example, and through your GI hormones, okay? Examples of your GI hormones, gastrin, secretin, and cholecystokinin, or CCK. All right, so first let me give you an example of a negative feedback loop, 
Okay, so here's an example. First, you're going to focus here on on. So food in the stomach causes the cells of the stomach wall to start releasing gastrin. Remember, gastrin is a hormone. What are hormones? Hormones are messengers. So then gastrin sends the message to your stomach glands to release the components of hydrochloric acid. So they continue doing this until your stomach pH reaches a 1.5 acidity. Then you get the negative feedback. This acidity in the stomach causes the cells of the stomach to stop releasing gastrin. And if you don't have this hormone to signal the, the stomach glands to release hydrochloric acid, then they're not going to release hydrochloric acid in sense turning it off. Okay. So here are the primary actions of your GI hormones. So like I said, gastrin responds to food in the stomach, is secreted from the stomach wall, and it, it stimulates your stomach glands to release hydrochloric acid. Your secretin responds to acidic chyme in the small intestine. Remember, this is the acidic chyme that comes from your stomach, and it's secreted from your duodenal wall. So what does it stimulate? Your pancreas to release bicarbonate-rich juices. Remember, the bicarbonate helps neutralize the acidic chyme. Then you have cholecystokinin. It responds to fat or protein in the small intestine. It's secreted from the intestinal wall, and it stimulates both the gallbladder and the pancreas. So it stimulates the gallbladder to secrete bile, and it stimulates the pancreas to release both bicarbonate and enzyme-rich juices into the small intestine. So they themselves don't do digestion. These hormones don't digest anything, but they're messengers, okay? All right, so the system at its best. The system is very sensitive and responds to the environment, right? So you get immunity against intestinal diseases, and it helps defend against foreign invaders. But it is very sensitive. That's why you get sick. That's why you get um, food um, poisoning, okay? The health of your digestive system depends on a healthy supply of blood, health, uh, lifestyle factors such as physical activity, it does impact your uh, digestive system, and the types of food eaten. So if you have an unhealthy diet, you're going to have an unhealthy gut. So you want to focus on balance, moderation, adequacy, and variety. Interestingly, the majority of your immune system is in your gut. So if you don't have a healthy digestion, you're not going to have a healthy immune system. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about common digestive problems. So the first one is choking. Choking happens when food slips into your trachea and it cuts off breathing. The international sign of choking is when you get your hands and hold them up to your neck. And then you come in and you do the Heimlich maneuver on somebody that is choking. In the next picture, in the next slide, I'll show you the picture. There are some foods that are commonly associated with choking. For example, those gumballs. They're nice, round, and smooth, and they could go and get lodged in the back of your throat. Same thing with a hot dog. When you bite off a piece of the hot dog, it could go to the back of your throat and get lodged. Okay? Um, so prevention of choking. I know it's simple, but do not talk with your mouth open and chew your food. There's some people that like to just like scarf their food down. Chew your food. All right, so this is what happens with choking. So here on the left, swallowing. This is normal swallowing, okay? Here's your tongue. This is the food. When food is swallowed, your epiglottis, which is this little thing right in here, closes this, the, the entrance to the trachea, which goes to the lungs. So when the epiglottis closes this area, it directs the food to go down into your esophagus, okay? Choking occurs when for some reason, instead of the food going into your esophagus, it actually goes into your trachea and it gets lodged. It just gets stuck. So when it gets stuck, there's no air coming in or out, so you can't talk, all right? So that's why you need the international sign of choking, which is this right here. Oops, sorry, let me go back. There you go, which is this right here. The Heimlich maneuver, this is what you do. You're going to stand behind the person with your arms wrapped around him or her. You're, you're going to make a fist with one hand and place the thumb side snugly against the body, slightly above the navel but below the breastbone. You don't want to be on the ribs. You want to be right underneath, okay, because if not, the ribs are not going to help you out. 
You're going to grasp the wrist with your other hand and you're going to do a quick upward and inward thrust to help lodge it out. So I know what you're doing is you're getting whatever oxygen is left in their lungs and you're forcing them to expel that air and push out that piece of food. If for some reason you're home alone and you don't have anybody to help you and by the time 911 gets there, you'll probably die of lack of oxygen. All you have to do is go to a chair and throw yourself over it. This might hurt a little bit on the side of your ribs, but hey, a couple cracked ribs are fine when it comes to saving your own life. <laughs> All right, vomiting. Vomiting is an adaptive mechanism of the body to purge itself when it's sick, when it has something making you sick, okay? Medical treatment includes hydration, and sometimes you want to self-induce vomiting. For example, when you swallow something that is poisonous, you want to self-induce vomiting to get that poison out. All right, then comes diarrhea. Causes of diarrhea could be infections or side effects of medication. Symptoms of medical conditions and treat. It could also be a symptom of medical conditions and treatment, such as irritable bowel syndrome or IBS and colitis. So treatment for diarrhea, rehydration. Simple as that. You just want to keep yourself hydrated and let the body do what it needs to do and purge itself from whatever is making you sick. All right, let's talk about irritable bowel syndrome and colitis. IBS is um, the characterization is frequent or severe abdominal pain and motility disturbance. The cause is really unknown. We don't know why people get IBS, but most people that have IBS know their triggers. For example, these are foods that cause this severe abdominal pain and diarrhea. So some people, for example, their triggers would be tomatoes. They can't have tomatoes. Stress is also a trigger. Smoking may be a trigger. So there's various triggers to this. Then you have colitis. Here is another terminology you're, uh, another um, that you're going to look into. Anything that has itis in it means inflammation. Col means colon. So it's the inflammation of the colon, inflammation of the large intestine. And surgery may be required if it's, if it's severe enough. All right, so let's talk about celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. What's an autoimmune disease? This is when your immune system attacks your own body, okay? So it causes inflammation of the small intestine. A lot of people have allergies or sensitivities to gluten. So people that have celiac disease look for gluten-free diets. Symptoms include abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating, and gas. And like I said, treatment, gluten-free diet, or anything else that may trigger this pain. All right, so constipation is a symptom, not a disease. Causes of constipation, a lifestyle. If you're constipated and you're sedentary, get up and walk. Moving actually helps get your bowels moving. And it's, it could also be a side effect of medication. How do you prevent constipation? Fiber, water, and physical activity. All right, so constipation can lead to hemorrhoids, diverticulosis. Some people use laxatives, but you have to be very careful with laxatives. Only once in a while, if you're constantly using laxatives, it's very harmful. You need to go see a doctor as to why you're so constipated. Another one is, another issue is harmful practices such as colonic irrigation, and it is exactly what it says. Some people think that the colon needs to be cleansed. So they go to somebody that does colonic irrigation. They stick a tube up your butt. Uh, sorry to be so rude, but that's exactly what it is. And they irrigate your colon. Your colon is not meant to be irrigated, all right? If you want a clean colon, drink a lot of water and, and consume a lot of fiber, okay? Now, remember when we were talking about fiber and to exercise your intestinal walls? If you don't do that, it could lead to diverticulosis, all right? So right down in here, you're going to have this weakening of the muscles in your colon. So you're going to start getting these little pouches because they're, it's weak and it's just going to kind of get this little pouch formation. So the plural um, term is diverticula, the singular is diverticulum. Now this could actually be very serious because you're going to have fecal matter accumulating there and because the, um, it's weakened, the, cell, uh, the muscles are weakened, and the wall of the intestine is weakened, they could actually burst, releasing feces and bacteria into your blood. So this could, diverticulosis can eventually be very, um, it could be life-threatening.
so it does require surgery. All right, belching and gas. Belching comes from swallowed air. The prevention, the best prevention is to eat with your mouth closed, eat slowly, and avoid um, gaseous drinks. Intestinal gas could be the consumption of certain foods such as beans. If you notice that you have an issue with beans, um, try cooking your own beans. What you do is you soak them overnight, throw out that water, rinse them, and then cook them in fresh water. Usually that takes care of the intestinal gas. Okay, It is individually determined. Right, ha Heartburn and acid indigestion. This is your gastroesophageal reflux or GERD or heartburn. There are tons of gas. Uh, the causes is your sphincter muscles are loose. Okay, um, smoking actually causes acid indigestion, and you could prevent it by not smoking. Obesity also increases the risk of you getting as um, heartburn. Why? Because when you're obese and you lay down on your back, you put all this pressure on your diaphragm and you push up. Okay, so try to avoid that. Indigestion causes, it could just be certain foods. For example, some people cannot have spicy food because it causes indigestions. How do you uh, treat it? Through antacids and acid controllers. But if you have chronic indigestion, you need to see a doctor and see what is causing it. It's not good to take antacid and acid controllers chronically. Um, if you have acid reflux, it could damage your esophagus. Why? Your esophagus doesn't have that nice mucus lining that your stomach does. So the acid that is going up your esophagus is going to start damaging your esophagus. And this could lead to Barrett's esophagus, esophagus, sorry, Barrett's esophagus, which increases your cancer risk. And cancer of the esophagus is very, very nasty. All right, so this is similar to a picture we saw before. Like I said, you have the weak and lower esophageal sphincters. And they don't close in between food. And if they don't close, what happens? Acid from the stomach goes up, irritating your esophagus. Ulcers. You have two types of ulcers. All right. In general, they're called peptic ulcers. So you have gastric ulcers, which are in your stomach, and then duodenal ulcers, which are in your duodenum, or doing, uh, yeah, duodenum in your small intestine. Causes bacterial infections such as H. pylori. Or H. pylori. Also, your anti inflammatory drugs such as NSAIDs, examples, Advil, ibuprofen, any of those, overuse of these drugs can increase the likelihood of you getting ulcers. And also, excessive gastric acid secretion. Okay? So, some people need, if it's bad enough, you do need to be under a treatment regimen through medication. Some people may require surgery. Bad enough, it could, um, if you have a really bad gastric ulcer, you could actually vomit uh, blood, okay, which is not good. So here are some strategies to prevent or alleviate common GI problems that you could um, read through. And a lot of them do have to do with a healthy lifestyle. If you have a healthy lifestyle, you probably will not be suffering from these.